All right, we're good. We're good. I think so. Okay, welcome on in. Hello. Happy Thursday. So today is exciting. We're going to be talking about cells. We're going to be talking about redox. We're going to be talking about detox. Things are going really well. Um, it's a beautiful day outside. I actually just came in from a beautiful walk. Um, always trying to get that sunlight in, especially during this time of day. Uh, trying to get all those different rays you possibly can. It's one of the easiest ways to build up your redox, your electrical potential, which we're going to touch on a little bit today. We're going to be building on our Body is Amazing series. This is what's going to come out on the blog tomorrow. So a uh, couple things real quick before we get started uh, is if you haven't signed up for the Becoming Invincible newsletter yet, it's for free. The link is in my bio. Um, actually, let me put that in here. And um, if you haven't checked out my uh, Nature's Kitchen and Cabinet book, it's everything you need to know about herbs, about superfoods, uh, kind of give you a baseline of where to get started. And I uh, just came out with a brand new video talking about how to reverse high blood pressure naturally. Oh, what's going on, Azeem? How you doing, man? Good to see you. Um, that is available too. So all those are linked on my bio. You can check it out. Um, should be on all my socials on YouTube, on IG. Uh, yeah. So today we're going to be talking about cellular healing. Now, if you go back to last week's blog, we talked about the cells themselves. So I don't want to rehash too much of that. Uh, but what we do got to talk about now is kind of we're building ourselves upward from a microscopic level. So we started, if you remember, talking about photosynthesis and chloroplasts. We talked about water. We talked about mitochondria. Then we talked about the bigger context as far as cells. Now we're talking about healing cells. And then how do we go how do we get nutrients to cells how do we get waste out of cells and then how do we uh, uh how do we support both of those things so if you don't know what's really cool roughly speaking we have we are made up of around 40 trillion cells but on top of that we have about a hundred trillion more bacteria fungi and other microbes that actually make up our microbiome so I, I mean, maybe you've heard me say this before. It is more accurate to look at each individual, each individual human being as a walking, talking, breathing ecosystem than an individual human, because there is so much literally more to us that is not human than actual human, which is kind of interesting to think about. So we have a flow system in the body um, and, and it, it kind of goes two ways. Now, most people are familiar with the circulatory system, the cardiovascular system, and it's made up of, uh, arteries and capillaries and veins. And this is our blood supply. Uh, this is essentially, uh, a good way to liken this is actually to our kitchen. It brings nutrients. It brings oxygen. It brings glucose. It brings everything cells need to function. That is really what red blood cells and really the cardiovascular system is, is doing. It's bringing that. What the veins do is bring those blood cells back to the lungs to get rid of carbon dioxide so that photosynthesis can happen, but also to get more oxygen and then repeat the cycle. We have a second system though in the body, and this is actually our lymphatic system. And this is more effectively, more, I think a better way to look at this is actually our bathroom, our sewer system. It is where we take all these wastes and our cells function very similar to us. You know, we take in food, we take in light, we take in nutrients, uh, we use what we need from it, and then we get rid of what we don't need in the form of sweat, urine, stool. Uh, breath actually is the, the primary way we get rid of uh, toxic material waste that we don't need anymore. Cells do the same thing. That's why when you hear me say nature is fractal, you know, everything, these processes are the same. It's just a question of scale, what, like what the, what's going on. So just like animals do it, uh, plants do it, we do it, and it happens all the way down at the cellular level. And these things need to flow um, in a few different ways here. So 
Blood vessels and lymphatic vessels, they're both made of collagen. Now, if you remember from what we talked about last week, uh, we talked about how cells themselves have a, have a negative charge on their exterior. They, they have a hydrophilic surface. And collagen in and of itself, in fact, most proteins we find in the body actually have a net negative charge. Now, if you remember all the way back to fourth grade in introduction to chemistry, you know that like charges repel each other. So turns out that this charge, this negative charge is partially responsible for the flow of blood, but also the flow of lymph. Now, if you remember again, further back in this series, when we talked about water, we have a exclusion zone water, which grows in the presence of sunlight, specifically infrared. So, and why is infrared important? Infrared is a longer wavelength than any of the visible light. That means it's also able to penetrate deeper into the body tissue. So infrared can actually penetrate virtually entirely through the body, depending on the angle you kind of use it. So in other words, it can reach every cell. So what happens when we get infrared light, we actually build that exclusion zone. And exclusion zone, structured water, has a negative charge. And this will occur, we'll get, we'll get this liquid crystalline structure that forms on any hydrophilic surface. So that includes blood vessels, that includes cells, including red blood cells, and that allows for this flow to happen. So it's not just, say, the pump of the heart. In fact, we now know that blood can, e can flow even if the heart stops for up to like 10 minutes. And that's totally due to this magnetic repulsion. It's that like, that like repels like that allows blood to continue to flow. And not only that, the same thing happens in the lymphatic system. Why? Because those lymph vessels are primarily made of collagen. So you get these liquids, fats, et cetera, that have a hydrophilic surface on them, they can be propelled to a degree just due to a difference in charge. And that allows for the flow of these things. So it's important to kind of keep that in mind. Now in red blood cells, to get a better idea of like how this works, in an earlier blog post, if you go back to the one on grounding, I talked about uh, zeta potential. Now zeta potential is this concept we're talking about. So the perimeter, or I should say the cell membrane of a red blood cell we know has a negative charge on it. As long as that negative charge is there, red blood cells aren't going to clump up together. But when that charge is depleted, when that charge is not as strong as it should be, it could potentially lead to clumping. That's how you get blood clots. It's this reduction of this negative charge on the cell membrane. And when you don't have that, it can potentially lead to clumping. And now you're talking about potential for blood clots, atherosclerosis. It's because we literally do not have that electric potential, that split of charge that we need for the body to function as well as it does. So that's a real world example of how not getting your reduction oxidation potential up, not getting the sunlight and grounding you need can directly affect, in this case, cardiovascular health. And this is just one example of that that's very obvious. And we'll, we'll talk more about it as we go. Now, with cells, there's five primary processes that the body has to go through on a regular basis if we are going to function at our best. And I've gone through these before, but it's important to repeat them. We have assimilating nutrients, excreting waste, growth, reproduction, and adaptation. And health can be defined essentially as anything that's going to improve assimilating nutrients, excreting waste, growth, reproduction, adaptation is going to improve your health. Anything that's going to impair any of those five is going to have a negative impact on your health. So assimilating nutrients, I've talked about this before. This is a, a big sticking point for me with, when we talk about nutrition and diet is I am of the camp that nutrition needs to focus more on our ability to absorb food and eliminate waste than just talking about nutrient density and things of that nature. Because if we're not absorbing anything, if we're not excreting the waste, 
it doesn't necessarily matter. Growth, not only from, you know, toddler to adulthood, but also cells. Cells grow, bones grow, tissues grow. This constantly happens throughout our, our time as human beings. Re reproduction, both at the species level, right, but also at the cellular level. Like we were talking about red blood cells. Red blood cells are going to have a lifespan of anywhere between like 90 and 120 days. They have, they have to reproduce new ones and more importantly, break down the old ones so we can get rid of excess iron, et cetera. And that's part of what the spleen does. And it's a whole thing. But and then adaptation. How do we constantly evolve and adapt to the environment that we in that we call the, the, the real world? Right. So all of these are important. Now, what we call disease, right, dis-ease primarily is going to come from one of three things. It's going to be a physical, chemical, or emotional stress. Now, those can be a variety of different things. Um, you know, from at the cellular level, though, what's really happening is tissues or cells are going to get damaged by two fundamental mechanisms. So there's three main causes, two fundamental mechanisms, and that's either mechanical trauma or chemical injury. And one of and either one of those can happen due to physical, chemical, or emotional stress. Um, so whether the body experiences, say, an injury or a trauma is one thing, uh, or a chemical damage to tissues or cells, the, the response mechanism is the same. Now, what do those chemicals kind of look like? It could be a plant poison, say, like poison ivy. It could be an animal venom, say, like a bee sting or a snake bite or a spider bite could be chemical elements, so heavy metals, drugs, fumes, pesticides, additives, et cetera, metabolic waste products. So again, cells have to get rid of their own waste too. Um, metabolic waste products by microorganisms, by our microbiome. So not only our own cellular ones, but uh, the microbiome itself, right? Those, those species also have to do the same thing. Uh, mechanical damage, like I mentioned, so uh, physical stress, physical injury, et cetera, or unfavorable electromagnetic and light environments. So this is non-native EMF exposure, artificial lighting, especially at night, fluorescence, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, de Bluetooth devices, uh, wearables, which is why I'm not a fan of really any of them. Um, yeah, all of those. Those are all going to impact our electrical redox potential down the road. When cells get damaged or when, when, they, when they get damaged to a significant degree, their cell membranes can rupture and this allows intracellular chemicals to be released. These are things like bradykinin, histamines, serotonin. They lead to uh, swelling, dilation of blood capillaries. This brings in plasma proteins, water, sodium, um, and then it brings out the inflammatory response in the body. Now, inflammation basically comes there there's there's five cardinal signs there's technically four but some people fought, call five uh rubor calor tumor dolor those four rhyme and those mean rubor redness calor warmth heat tumor swelling dolor is pain there's a fifth one called functiolasia which is loss of function so they don't work as well um those are going to be the cardinal signs of inflammation now with inflammation, inflammation in and of itself is not necessarily a bad thing. We actually need inflammation at the right times. If I cut my hand, I want that to get inflamed and bring healing markers and white blood cells and, and fibrinogen and all these things that I need to kind of repair that. We need those things. Obviously, the problem comes in when we lean too much into the inflammatory side, specifically for too long. And, but we need this response to happen. And even if you go, uh, you know, our, our bodies create 300 million new cells pretty much every minute. So this constant build up, tear down, repair, uh, get rid of the old, bring in the new is constantly happening. This is the life cycle, again, at a different scale, nature's fractal. So what we know, though, that happens in each of these cells is cells create water through cellular respiration, right? We've talked about this over previous weeks. Uh, through cellular respiration, we take electrons from food, from grounding, from the sun. 
bring them through the electron transport chain. What ends up getting made? We get ATP, we get carbon dioxide, and we get water. The water is very important because, again, this water is not the same water that you see here in this water bottle. It is. It has a gel-like consistency, and it also is able to separate charges via this exclusion zone. That's why sunlight's really important. It builds this exclusion zone. It builds that negative charge, but more importantly, that charge separation between the two. However, when that exclusion zone gets smaller, maybe we're not getting outside. Maybe we're not getting the infrared inputs. The electrical activity is not as high. Cells can potentially die. And if they're not replaced as, as efficiently as they should be, this can essentially lead to a failure of tissues, right? Because what are tissues other than a collection of cells doing a similar thing? So liver cells are, are, are the functional units of the liver tissue, right? So if enough liver cells are not do not have this electrical charge, that could potentially lead to liver damage. Then we're talking about symptoms down the road. So that's just one example. But we're again, we're working our way up. So, you know, this is why symptoms are important. But I do think if, if you're just treating things to alleviate symptoms and you don't continue going, you're missing the point of the healing process because symptoms are kind of like the last stage of, of, of things going wrong. So we have to continue the nutrition, the lifestyle stuff beyond the after symptoms subside if you want to address the, the true healing. And this is why prevention and healing kind of go hand in hand. This isn't, you know, allopathic Band-Aid type model stuff. This is why real healing is not true healing is not for, you know, the feeble minded. I kind of mentioned that yesterday. This is for people who like need who are willing to do work for a really long time and have to address a lot of different factors. Things like emotional burdens, lack of sunlight, artificial light at night. We went over toxic foods, pesticides, traumas, daily exposure to stressful situations, fluoride, uh, heavy metal exposure, pharmaceutical drug usage, um, non-native EMFs we talked about, like all of these things add to that toxic burden. There isn't one cause for these things. It is in a quantum world, which is one we live in, there is no really real cause and effect. It is probabilities. It is how does everything add up together and what might be, what What are the things that make a part, make the parts of the whole? It's not this one thing caused this outcome, so we need an RCT to, to, to do it. No, like Nature does not function in the realm of RCTs. She functions in her own pace with her own set of rules. It is our job as clinicians, as human beings, as researchers, as just genuinely curious people to understand that, but more importantly, work in line with it. And what we've seen is there are so many folks now that in this modern world, we're just very divorced from that. And we're looking for solutions to tech problems that tech is causing. And that's not to say that all tech is bad because it, it certainly allows me to, to do what I'm doing now and connect with you. So it's not necessarily like it's all bad, but we need to understand the context and the whole situation. And more importantly, not add to the burdens that modern humans have already put on themselves, which is a greater burden than any human beings have ever faced at any time point in history. Uh, that's just what it is. So it really isn't about judgment. It isn't about judging other people. It's about understanding the context and doing the best you can to work in that situation, right? So kind of back to where we were going. So we, like I mentioned before, we have two general types of circulation. We have the blood, we have the cardiovascular circulatory system, and we have the lymphatic system. So we have two systems here. And like I mentioned, the blood is going to function essentially as the kitchen. The, the cardiovascular system is going to bring stuff to cells that we need for the cells to do their thing. And then it's going to go back to the kitchen to get the next dish and come back out. That's effectively what's happening. The lymphatic system is a little bit different. It is the sewer system. It is the bathroom. It is the garbage collector to clean up the mess, the bus boy, if you will, um, at this restaurant that we call the body at this point. So... There's a lot going on here. 
Now, what we need to understand, though, is context, because we spend so much time talking about blood, talking about blood tests, talking about the importance of blood. Now, in general terms, the body is roughly 60% fluid. 62.5% of that fluid is intracellular. It is inside each of the cells. That leaves 37.5%. 7.5% of that is blood in the bloodstream. The other 30% is interstitial fluid or lymph. So in other words, if we're talking about the extracellular fluids, blood is only 20% and the lymphatic fluid is 80% of this fluid that we have cycling in our body. Yet we spend so much time focusing on the 20%, which is the blood. That's not necessarily to say that using blood tests and stuff is an, is, isn't helpful because it can be, but you're missing the bigger picture, which is the functioning of the lymphatic system. And, and just because it's poorly understood in, in, in the, in the main model, I mean, even when I was in school, I did not learn a ton about it, you know, does not mean it's not incredibly important, especially when, like I said, most of the, the extracellular fluid in the body is actually lymph and interstitial fluid and not blood. So we need to get a better understanding of what this is. And one of the doctors who I think talked about this the most was C. Samuel West. I have a quote by him here. The lymph system in the body is like a tree. As I tell about what the lymph system looks like, then I'd like to, uh, you to repeat it as I give it to you and you'll never forget it again. The lymph system, we will simply describe like this. The branches go up in the head to the roots down to the feet. The tree trunk is in the chest, and it's called the thoracic duct. So what does that mean? We have nodes, right? We have lymph nodes. Branching out of those lymph nodes, we have a lot of lymph fluid flowing through lymphatic vessels. What happened? And there's and there's also other lymph tissues that play a role as well. We have things. We have primary lymphoid organs, which are going to be your bone marrow and your thymus. This is where you get your B and T cells. The B cells come from the bone marrow. The T cells come from the thymus. We have other lymphoid tissue as well. So we have the lymph nodes I mentioned, but we also have the spleen. We have the appendix, which is really important. Um, we have mucosal lining. So this is your gut-associated lymphoid tissue or mucosal-associated uh, lymphoid tissue called GALT or MALT. This is where a lot of our immune system actually lives. It's in this lymphatic fluid. So the, lymph, the, the lymphatic system in and of itself, you could kind of call your immune system because that is where a lot of these white blood cells, we mentioned B and T cells, but there's neutrophils, there's basophils, there's a ton of other ones, most of which are circulating in, in the lymphatic tissue. Because that is, again, that is the septic system. That is where we take in the toxins and then process them for elimination. It's incredibly extensive. Uh, in the body, roughly, there's somewhere between 600 and 700 lymph nodes, which is a ton. It, it, it's a massive amount. And in each of those lymph nodes is where a lot of the white blood cells and immune system resides. It's not as much in the vessels versus the nodes. So the nodes are primarily where you're going to find them. Then once this is filtered, what we're finding out, and this is something that I've learned from Dr. Robert Morse, so I want to give him credit for this. And then there's actually been studies that are showing this, which I think is just fascinating, is we always get this concept that the lymph gets dumped back into the blood supply. When if you think about it, that generally doesn't make a ton of sense, because why would you dump waste back into your kitchen, into your blood supply? It actually, if you look, if you look into it, and I'll have some some studies on this in tomorrow's blog post, but. The kidneys themselves actually have lymphatic vessels that go to them. And effectively, just like the kidneys filter blood, it also filters this lymphatic fluid. So urine primarily is going to be a way that we can filter out a lot of these lymphatic cellular wastes. Digestive wastes are primarily going to go out through the colon, right? It's from what we eat, and it comes out through a bowel movement. These cellular wastes obviously are not as big and they're primarily in a fluid, right? They're in water effectively. So getting cycled out through this lymphatic system 
through that makes a lot more sense. And this flow, like I mentioned, is, is really important. So, um, so with that, so the lymphatic system in and of itself has three, three kind of major functions. It, it functions as a cellular highway. So basically it's transporting metabolic waste, damaged cells, fats, hormones, uh, from tissues and that stuff can go to the bloodstream if it needs to but some of the waste and damaged cells are going to get exported via the kidneys uh, fluid homeostasis so part of what the lymphatic system does is it allows uh, for the mopping up of extra fluid so you know it helps reduce swelling by getting swelling out of an area once we don't need that inflammation anymore and then also immune signaling so a lot of our immune system, like I said, is in that in those lymphatic vessels. So it, it, it functions as a way of communication, which I think is really important. And one of the best ways to actually enable, enhance the function of the lymphatic system, a lot of people talk about rebounding, uh, which is super useful, but, but proper breathing patterns are so important. The... Lymphatic system does not have a pump like the heart to, to pump blood. It, we don't have an equivalent for that, or we don't have, we don't have an equivalent for that. Now, like I mentioned, that alone does not necessarily allow for the flow of things. But what is important is we have a diaphragm, and the diaphragm contracts down and relaxes up every time we breathe. But primarily, it's going to function a lot better when we are nasally breathing. So when I see folks who mouth breathe or I hear that they snore or I'm told that they snore or, or something of that nature, mouth breathing is not going to allow for that same diaphragmatic movement. And the diaphragm in and of itself, yes, actually allows for the expansion and contraction of the lungs, but it also allows for the pumping of the lymphatic system along with movement, uh, tissue manipulation, like massage, uh, some, some energy practices can certainly do it, but deep breathing it is the most overlooked nasal breathing. I should say is the most important part of this, that a lot of folks don't necessarily do well all the time. This is what I've seen in my practice. This is why, you know, in the breathe easy master course, it's all about reintroducing, relearning nasal breathing so that you can eliminate a lot of these issues and improve oxygenation to all tissues, but also improve lymphatic flow throughout the body. So there's a lot of different ways that we can get lymphatics to move. So certainly increasing, like, like we could kind of mention, building that electric electrical charge, that negative charge on hydrophilic surfaces but also within them, themselves is going to go a long way. What is one way we can do that? A lot of raw natural foods, particularly chlorophyll rich ones, fruits, these are going to bring electrolytes. What do electrolytes do? They bring the electrons you need. That's going to be part of it. Um, other things that can be really useful. Uh, some people will use uh, bioelectromagnetic therapies uh, subtle energies from say like laying on of hands or Reiki or reflexology, Tai Chi, ac acupuncture, obviously things like rebounding are going to be really useful, but these are all different modalities you can use on top of getting those baseline electrons that you need. And this is where, uh, redoxing is so important. This is why uh, you might hear me say from time to time, redox before you detox. So even when I work with clients now, like, you know, there, there usually is a period where we're, we have to prepare ourselves for a detox, because if you jump right into things and maybe you've experienced this, this yourself, you'll go really hard into like a parasite cleanse or, or some sort of herbal remedy or something that's really intense really quickly. And you have really, negative reactions or you feel worse or lethargic or or and then it's like oh like it didn't work but the truth is you actually have, actually have to build the body up to this you have to clean up the terrain a bit you have to bring in the electrons that you need for the body to function as well as it could before you kind of do that stuff 
So redoxing before you detoxing before you detox is really important. Now I've talked about this last week. Part of what allows for this flow and building that that EZ so that EZ effectively works this liquid this liquid crystal lattice. It allows for the flow of electrons in the body. And this is done primarily through semiconduction. Now, this is when, if you go back to last week's blog with, with Robert Becker, he found that bone, for example, functions with semiconduction. It's not through nervous signaling like we think, like everything electrical is just the nervous system. It's not. He found that bone could actually conduct electricity using semiconduction and uh, because it had N-type and P-type semiconductors, the N-type being collagen, which is extra electrons, the P-type being appetite, these form PN junctions, which effectively create diodes and allow for electricity to flow at the speed of light, which is a lot faster than what we can do, uh, or at least what nerves can do, I, sh I should say it that way, because we do do this. Now, put it simply, Redox. Redox means reduction oxidation. I think we all learned this at some point in chemistry, maybe in high school. Reduction effectively means you're gaining electrons. Oxidation means you're losing. So it's this transfer of electrons from one atom to another. That's a redox reaction. Your car, combustion engines work on redox reactions. That is effectively what is happening. Um, yeah. So, so that is effectively what this works or how this works. Now, mitochondria, for example, we've talked about this in the past couple of weeks. We reverse photosynthesis by creating water and CO2 along with ATP. Uh, part of that, you'll notice uh, across the inner mitochondrial membrane, the matrix is going to be a bit higher in pH, more negative. The the inner mate the uh, inner inside the inner membrane is going to be a bit more proton heavy. It's going to be more acidic. There's going to be a lower pH, right? Because the, the lower the pH, the more protons you have, the more H plus. Electrons are negative. So just so you kind of have an idea here. So we require a negative charge or electrons in certain areas of the body, like the inside of cells, like the inner mitochondrial membrane, like we just talked about the extracellular matrix around proteins, because these allow for exclusion zones to build. And maintaining this electrical charge allows for maximum ATP production and water, uh, proper oxygen distribution, uh, allows for proper cellular function. It, you could clear reactive oxygen and reactive nitrogen species. Um, you could generate direct current using this semiconduction that we just talked about. And again, I talked more about this last week. So go to that that blog if you didn't if you or last week's video if you want to hear more about it. So making sure we're having this system kind of up and running is going to be a better place to start. Now, how do we gather these electrons? How do we build this negative charge? It's primarily going to happen through gaining electrons. So how do we do this? We do this from grounding. We do it from getting sunlight, especially exposure to UV and red and infrared. Uh, infrared in and of itself comes from sunlight. You could do sauna, exercise, right? Because infrared, another word for that is heat. We experience infrared as heat. Uh, panels can do it. Uh, mineral rich water. So getting your electrolytes. Also easy rich foods. What are, what are foods rich in structured water? They're fruits and vegetables. That also happens to be where a lot of these minerals, these electrolytes are. Your calcium, your magnesium, your potassium. What are, you know, the most common mineral deficiencies we see? It's magnesium. It's potassium. It, it, it's not, it shouldn't be rocket science. Movement is another reason. What is movement? We get, we get electrons from movement because of piezoelectricity. All that means is you use pressure. You use a mechanical stress to produce an electric current. That's it. Also want to minimize things that deplete the EZ. So blue light fluoride, anesthesia, indoor living, non-native EMFs, not moving, uh, wearing shoes all the time, not getting your feet or hands on, on anything outside, sunglasses, pesticides, uh, seed oils, processed foods, all of these things are going to diminish that ease, that easy. So that is the first step is we need to build up that redox potential before we get into detox. 
Now, the second part of this is how do we get rid of the waste? Now, primarily speaking, there or generally speaking, there's four primary ways we get rid of waste. We have breath, which is actually the 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 how most waste is is eliminated. It's through the lungs, through breathing, the colon, the kidneys and bladder, and sweat, right? We have breath, poop, pee, sweat. That's it. Four ways we get rid of toxins. So making sure that the lungs, colon, kidneys, bladder, and skin are doing what they should is going to make sure that we're on a path where we are eliminating the things we need to in an efficient manner. So the lungs, like I already mentioned, is pretty straightforward. Um, it's reversing photosynthesis. We breathe in the oxygen that plants give us. We give back off CO2 that the plants then reuse, that take that and light and water to create sugars. That's why when you actually consume fruits and vegetables, you effectively are consuming actual light energy just transformed into that. And it's interesting because you might notice this if you go on vacation to like the tropics or somewhere warm, that you actually need less food if you're spending more time outside because you're actually getting that from the sun, maybe going in the ocean, being in nature a lot more because that's really where a lot of humans should be, is you probably in tropical regions. Um, but if you don't live in one and you say and go on vacation there, that's something you might notice, just worth kind of thinking about. This is also why if you're in a sympathetic dominant state or mouth breathing all the time, making sure we're getting that nasal breathing is really important because it is the primary way that most waste products are eliminated through the body. It's going to be through the lungs, believe it or not. The colon, um, Bernard Jensen, probably one of my favorite people to learn from. Um, as you guys know, I'm a big fan of iridology. I use it with all my clients. Um, he, one of the big things he was, he was big on though, was bowel management was understanding the importance of proper bowel movements on making sure we're keeping the colon and digestive tract at moving as well as it should. And we're absorbing what we should. And this is why, again, I, I continue to harp on this. Nutrition should be primarily focused on maintaining and enhancing the function of the elimination organs. That should be primary over nutrient density. So this concept of carbohydrates and proteins and fats does not necessarily matter. It should be the more focused on the passage of protons and electrons through mitochondria than this concept of macronutrients that, that so much of the conventional space is, is focused on. It, it, it's looking at the wrong thing. This is why I've built this up over the last three months, going back through these blogs, because if you don't understand that part, then we can't have this conversation. So that's a big part of it. The kidneys. Um, I mean, I've already talked about this a little bit, but this is one of those things I think Dr. Morse has right. And, and, and more science recently is, is showing this, that the lymphatics are going to primarily be cleansed through the kidneys, ultimately filtered out through urine. So, and again, I, I've posted some stuff in, in the, uh, in tomorrow's blog that you can actually see this, but yeah, it's going to be the digestive waste and cellular waste, or really the cellular waste that are going to be function, uh, filtered out through the lymphatic system and ultimately filtered out through the kidneys via urine. And a lot of folks, especially when you're consuming a lot of highly acidic foods, uh, a lot of meats, dairies, processed foods, et cetera, these are, these leave an acidic ash. They're going to create an imbalance with those electrolytes, right? So, so the kidneys really take a beating. And unfortunately, like until you get to the end stages where, you know, maybe it's blood pressure for some folks, maybe it's um, gout or, or stones start forming. Like there's not a lot of symptoms for it, but if say blood pressure is going up, the kidneys is certainly one of the first places you're going to look. Why? Because blood is also filtered through there and that the kidneys act as a sensor for the adrenal glands to produce certain hormones to regulate blood pressure. That's part of what the kidneys do. They act as kind of like a sensor for the pharmacy of the body that we call the adrenal glands. The skin is another big one. It actually, we can sometimes call it the third kidney. This is why sweating 
at least three to four times a week, getting a solid sweat is crucial. Um, you know, if you're not sweating a lot or have trouble with it, that might be a sign of something going on with the hypothalamus, maybe uh, pituitary, pineal, something off there, or the thyroid. So if there is a weakness in one of those glands, we have to really fix that, and that could maybe help with the sweating. So I am certainly a fan of doing exercise first as far as breaking the sweat because you get so many more benefits, but certainly sauna, um, uh, saunas, red lights, salt baths, Epsom salt baths, uh, all these things can help achieve sweating. So just to wrap this up, you know, really quick, Regeneration is governed by five key processes. We have the assimilation of nutrients. We have the excretion of wastes. We have growth. We have reproduction. We have adaptation. Anything that's going to improve those, better for health. Anything that's going to be a detriment to those, going to make health worse. First, we need to build up our redox potential. How do we do that? We get sunlight daily, especially in the morning. We nasally breathe. We ground. We get organic foods, primarily a lot of fruits and vegetables going to build that up before we detox. And we want to make sure those detox pathways are up and running before we go into something a bit deeper. The body has the ability to heal and regenerate itself. It's just a question of getting out of the way and, 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 and letting nature do its thing. In fact, there's a quote from BJ Palmer that's great. Um, just to kind of leave this off, it's just, nature needs no help. Just no interference. And I feel like I say that every week, just in different words, but something to take home. So that's kind of big picture of what's going on. Again, there'll be more detail and links and stuff tomorrow. Um, I do have something new coming for you guys on sleep. It's probably going to be at some point next week. So bear with me. Um, but for now, if you haven't checked out Nature's Kitchen and Cabinet, if you want to learn about superfoods, and herbs, and, and a little bit about alkalization. You can check it out, the links in my bio. We were just talking about blood pressure and kidneys. I have a brand new video on how to naturally reverse high blood pressure. The link is in my bio. You can check it out. Um, and yeah, if you haven't signed up for the Becoming Invincible newsletter, they are pretty in-depth and deep. Um, they're new every week, although I am taking a week off next week for Thanksgiving. There will also be no live for this next week. Um, so new blog, new live will be two weeks from now. But uh, yeah, until then, thank you for tuning in. I'll see you guys next time. All right, so YouTube is done.